Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, a podcast for everyone who loves books, where we explore questions we can't stop wondering about. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and Summer of Stolen Secrets. And I'm Evie O'Hallam. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. We are so glad that you can join us for this episode of Book Dreams, which we are especially excited about. Today, we're talking to two different guests about the unsung influence of Native Americans on the world of comedy. I have the feeling this is going to stay on our list of favorite episodes for a really long time. We got the idea when we saw publicity for a book called We Had a Little Real Estate Problem, The Unheralded Story of Native Americans in Comedy by Cliff Nestroff. We thought that title alone was funny, and we learned later that it's the punchline to a famous joke told by Charlie Hill, the first Native American comedian to appear on network television. We'll have more on Charlie Hill later in the episode. But we asked Cliff, the author of the book, if he would speak with us. He said yes, and he offered to introduce us to Native American comedian Adrian Chalapa. We are so glad that she agreed to join us as well. Yes, two phenomenal guests. First, a little bit about Adrienne. She's been a professional comic for more than a decade. She's the founder of indigenous femme comedy troupe, Ladies of Native Comedy. And she plays the role of Shannon Diabo on Peacock's hit new show, Rutherford Falls. She's also one of the authors featured in Funny Girl, an anthology of women comics and writers. Adrian was raised on the Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation in Oklahoma, and she's an enrolled member of the Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma and a member of the Apache Tribe of Oklahoma. You can stream her performances on Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, and Peacock. Cliff was a stand-up comic for eight years before turning his attention to writing about the olden days of show business. Now, Vice has dubbed him the Human Encyclopedia of Comedy. In 2015, he wrote the book, The Comedians, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy, which was named a Best Book of the Year by Kirkus Reviews, National Post, and Split Cider. We Had a Little Real Estate Problem is his second book. It came out this year. We want to start by sharing our conversation with Adrian. We asked first if she would tell us about a confrontation she had with stand-up comic Ralphie May about his racist language denigrating Native Americans. Here's what she said. I (laughs) never meant to actually confront him. I didn't think that he would actually respond. I was very naive. I was a new Twitter user. (laughs) Mm. I came across some audio years prior of a stand-up act he did about Native Americans. And it was, in my opinion, atrocious because it somehow justified our genocide. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things I cannot really tolerate. Like I can tolerate many, many types of racism, especially funny things. If it's funny enough, I can handle anything. But this to me was not even really that funny. It was just punching down, in my opinion, because here was this, white man with a big platform and you know he's basically saying that natives got what they deserved and he doesn't feel bad about it it sounded like a rant so as a comedian I felt like well I'm gonna approach this from a comedic perspective I'm going to ask my friends to weigh in do they think it's funny because maybe it's me because I am humble enough to admit then maybe I'm the sensitive one and I need to take a seat. I like conversations. I like dialogue. And that's all I was trying to do. And so I posted this clip on my YouTube, asked my friends to weigh in. And of course, everybody was just beyond offended. (laughs) They were ready for action. I did not expect that. I didn't expect it to go viral. I put it on Twitter. I didn't expect for Ralphie to actually respond to me. And he did. And then it just took off like a wildfire that I couldn't control. People Mm -hmm. started threatening him. People Mm -hmm. started threatening me. And Mm -hmm. I got my first lesson in the eels of the internet. And it was a really dark time for me. And maybe him as well, because 
he actually had some shows canceled and he was feeling bad about the people who depended on those shows for money. And of course, his career was hurt. So we had a conversation. We sat down and talked because at the end of the day, I'm human. He's human. And we can try to see eye to eye. And I loved that about him that he, at first he tried to defend himself. He got very defensive and was like, you know, it's comedy. Don't take it out of its context, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I understood that completely. But at the same time, I was like, well, the damage is done. This thing is spreading. You're losing your shows. And I did tell my fan base, like, calm down. Do not attack this man over his physical appearance. Because that's what everybody was doing. They always go for the physical appearance. And Mm -hmm. I think that's just the cheapest thing anyone can do. So I try to calm things on my end because I know at the end of the day that he has a family and I don't want anyone attacking him. He's somebody's father and son. And when we ended up talking, I explained to him that the reason why it hurts so much is because our communities are still dealing with the aftermath of a genocide. And we're not out of it yet. We're not in the clear yet. Our youth have the highest suicide rate in the country. They have gotten it into their heads that they are not welcome and not wanted and not seen or heard in this country. So they are killing themselves at alarming rates. I said, it doesn't help if you're a Native kid and you're a comedy fan. It all started with me being a fan of his. I loved his work. I thought he was so funny. And then for him to basically attack a community that doesn't have a huge political platform, Mm -hmm. it felt like bullying. And it reminded me of, you know, when I was a kid and people would love to bully the native kids. I just couldn't stand for it. So I called him out. And once he understood that this wasn't this faraway land or this faraway thing that had happened in the 1800s and we should just get over it. Once he understood that we're very much dealing with very racist laws and regulations to this day, that we're still very much overregulated in this country, unseen. And the narrative is still very much that We were the inferior race and therefore we got what we deserved. When in reality, I have so many stories about so many heroic deeds and so many strong women and men and non-binary people in our communities and these never get told. So I just tried to explain that to him and he totally understood and he apologized. The thing that was the most profound and the lesson that we learned was that our American education system sucks so bad. He basically said, I am a product of the American education system. And I'm sorry. I was ignorant. And now I know. From that moment on, he did everything in his power to elevate me and voices like me. He organized, helped organize a fundraiser where the aid would go directly to one of the poorest reservations in the country for heat in the winter. He really put his money where his mouth was. And I forever will be happy with how that whole situation turned out as hard as it was in the beginning to have that conversation. And when I finally met him, he pulled me aside and he said, thank you for calling me out because you educated me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it felt good. But at the same time, I realized for every one Ralphie, there's a million more that are just going to stand their ground and say, no, I'm going to stick with the textbook version. Yeah. Yeah. So in ninth grade, you were suspended from school for being a class clown. Can you tell us that story? It started at the beginning of ninth grade. I just came back to school with such an attitude. In middle school, it was a disaster as it was for most people. And I really had grown into myself, my identity and my voice. And I 
was basically just <laughs> kicking ass and taking names. And I, I, I just came back not wanting to get bullied and not wanting to be a victim. So I decided, well, I'm going to use this smart ass mouth of mine, which I had always had but never really used it at school for fear of getting in trouble. But my name for a year, I just really wasn't in the mood to deal with anything or anyone. So I made fun of everything and anyone. And that included my teachers. I think back on the things I said, and I actually feel bad because I was bullying some of my teachers mm -hmm. I mean all of them literally all of them I just went from one class to the next bullying them but the thing was I felt very under attack in the school system as it was every history class I had ever taken in Oklahoma there was a deliberate erasure of my people I'm Kiowa and Apache those are my tribes. And I felt like there was a pressure to assimilate and to not be Native. I never quite understood all the pressure to just be like this good white girl that was doing everything right in their eyes. I just realized at some point that I could never achieve that. It was just interesting because middle school was full of me trying, I mm -hmm. think, to be white because I am light skinned and my mom is white and my dad is native. But I definitely take after my dad when it comes to all things politics and even identity. My, my dad made sure that at a young age, I realized that I was native before anything else, really, because of maybe just the political state that he grew up in. So I basically failed at being white in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> and also the town I lived in didn't recognize my whiteness. It was very much segregated in the way that like, if you are native and you hang out with the native kids, you're native, just stay over there. I did try to like cross over and hang out with the white kids, but they always gave me such an attitude and such a like, ew, don't sit with us. I just didn't want to feel like that. So definitely I came back ninth grade, like, you know what, this is me. I'm not going to hide anything or apologize or try to be something I'm not. I'm a loud ass native girl and this is who I am. So yeah, I got detention every single day. Wow. <laughs> wow. I got detention every day. And then I just sat in detention and talked more crap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can I just ask really quickly, you said that you regret, you know, a lot of the things that you said to the teachers. Can you give one example? Yes. Uh, my homeroom teacher, I made fun of her hair. <laughs> She had this just giant wave of really the tsunami, if you will, of hair. And I felt like I had to make fun of it. One day she asked, does anyone have any questions? Oh. And I raised my hand. And then she's like, is this serious, Adrian?" And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, what is it? And I said, is that your real hair or do you wear a wig? Oh, <laughs> and God. she just kind of rolled her eyes and said, it's my real hair. And then I said, are you sure? Because it really looks like a wig. My friend and I are back here talking and we have decided it's a wig. And so it's just like terrorizing like that. But I look back on it and I'm like, you know, it's not the worst thing I could have said, but I try not to attack people's appearances now. That's something I had to learn. Yeah. It sounds like you'd had plenty of years of being provoked. There was a lot of pressure that led up to that ninth grade year for you. Yeah. And you know, my regret though, is that I didn't take more of it out on the students who actually bullied me. I felt like I was really taking it out on the teachers because they represented the institution. Mm -hmm. In reality, they were very much underpaid and overworked. And 
many I viewed just there for a paycheck, but didn't deserve a ninth grader going through a teenage angst. But by the end of the year, I had gone through all the detentions I could go through. I got in school suspension where they put you in a little room in a little cubicle and they hope that with you not being around anybody that you'll just straighten yourself out. And that didn't work because I actually just enjoyed the alone time and then went back to school refreshed. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing worked at that point. My mom couldn't threaten me or anything. There was nothing my mom could say either. I was just like imploding at home as well. And then at the very end of the school year, um, the last straw was an argument I had with my history teacher, which I felt was very justified. And it was about the origins of how Native people got here. I felt like I had a good grasp of where I came from. I'm Kiowa and I'm Apache and we originate from Southern Alberta, Canada. And in our creation stories, that's where it places us. I didn't like being told anything else. (laughs) I was like, nope, you know, you don't have this knowledge that I do for generations. I was actually kept impeccable record keeping. We had these calendars that recorded everything from astrological events to wars, everything. So Mm -hmm. I felt very offended that they would try to tell me that I was from Asia. And I was like, no, I'm not. That's a theory. There's a reason why they call it bearing straight theory and not bearing straight fact. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They just were done with me. They kicked me out. And then my mom was not happy at all because she had high hopes for me and my education. And I love her for that. So she called the school and said, we need her to finish her ninth grade year. And they said, well, she can come back if, if she gets swatted with a paddle. And I did. <laughs> so I went back to school and they took a paddle to me. What? And- I'm sorry, my mouth is hanging open, which you can't see because <laughs> we're doing a, yeah, wow. So I got paddled with a paddle with holes in it. It did hurt, but it also didn't shut me up. It didn't work. At that point, I finished out my ninth grade year. And then um, after that, my mom was like, you know, you can't go to public school. Where are you going to go? And I knew it too. I was like, I can't handle public school because it's, to me, it's just indoctrination and I can't do it. I can't take this quietly. Mm-hmm. So my mom sent me to boarding school, a Native American boarding school ran by the government. And then began my journey in the United States custody. Sorry, I, this is not part of our list of questions, but I feel like I should ask you about your experience in a government-run school for Native Americans. What was it like? It was very institutionalized. When I got there, they search your belongings and your person for contraband, you know, drugs and alcohol. Then I made friends <laughs> and uh, made a lot of friends that were just like me, just kind of struggled through school. And see, academically, I was on par all through elementary and middle school and even ninth grade. I was always a straight A student. So I didn't struggle in that realm. I just struggled with my behavior because I was over the entire thing. But at boarding school, uh, I met plenty of others just like me, Native students who slipped through the cracks, who needed more support than a public school could give them. And some of them were court ordered. Some of them were orphaned. I considered myself somewhere in the gray area because I wasn't court ordered, but I couldn't go to public school and I wasn't orphaned, but my parents were very much done with me. Mm. So I found myself 15 on my own. Um, Anything I needed and wanted, I had to just get it myself with the help of the government. (laughs) It was, it was hard because I knew the history of the school. I knew that the school originally started in 1871 with the goal of assimilating natives and stripping them of their culture, oftentimes in a very abusive way. I knew that this school 
was built probably on literal bodies of children who didn't make it. I knew these things going in. And I also went in with a lot of stories from my own relatives. I had so many family members that attended this school before me and told me everything from the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I went in thinking this might be a horrible experience, but I have to keep my head up and it's my last chance to graduate. So I have to do this. Mm. But back to how this school is, um, it was a uh, an environment that I needed at that time because my aunt worked in the administrative office. My uncle worked in one of the dorms. I had cousins that went to school there. I was very much surrounded by family. My teachers for the first time looked like me. For the first time I had a Kiowa teacher who could understand my language And for the first time, I was taking language classes and I was learning my language at a more fluent level. And so this school at one point was meant to strip the culture out of Native kids. And when Native people took over the school, took over the administration and the teaching positions and the dorm staff, the school completely shifted into a place of healing. So it was very much a different experience for me than it had been generations before. And I feel very fortunate for that. But I did know the history. And so it's kind of a, I feel like a survival's guilt that I struggle with sometimes because I know that I got the healing end of that deal and the generations before did not. The institutionalization of the students is probably my only complaint Many of the students came in and we were not criminals, but we were treated like criminals. There have been some horrifying news pieces recently involving the kinds of government-run schools that Adrienne attended. As she said, by the time she enrolled in 2001, things were better, but both the United States and Canada have an appalling history of taking Native children from their families and sending them to government and church-run schools in an effort to eradicate their culture and assimilate them and really erase them as a people. It was forbidden in these schools for the kids to speak their native languages and practice their traditions. Many of them faced neglect and physical and sexual abuse, and many died. Just this year, the remains of 215 indigenous children, including some as young as the age of three, were found on the grounds of one former residential school in Canada, and 751 unmarked graves were discovered at the site of another Canadian Indigenous school just this year. It's so very deeply sad. Here in the United States, Interior Secretary Deb Holland has ordered her department to prepare a report on the U.S. government's own boarding school program with an emphasis on cemeteries and potential burial sites. It's a history we don't talk enough about and one that Cliff discusses in We Had a Little Real Estate Problem. The devastating mistreatment of Native people has, of course, not been limited to schools. The effects are ongoing and they're everywhere. We asked Adrian whether it's the case that Native American comedians often face challenges, like having to drive five hours each way for a show that might have no audience. And here's what she said. Yes, 100 percent. The isolation of Native people tends to be our biggest obstacle in the entertainment business. Because not only are you trying to find a scene to work your craft that feels right for you, but you're also trying to pay the bills, right? And so many times you'll drive five, six hours for a gig that pays, you know, a hundred, maybe nothing, but um, I always try to get paid because It just makes sense math wise, but maybe just the amount of money that it took to get there, you'll come back in the red and you just got to give yourself a pep talk. Like I'm paying my dues, you know, I'm getting started and stuff like that. Why do you think they keep going, notwithstanding all of these challenges? What is the power that comedy has for them? Speaking just for myself, 
I feel like comedy is so cathartic. It's so healing. Before I found stand-up comedy, I was really struggling with a lot of depression and just intergenerational trauma and trying to figure out where I fit in in this world. And the first time I got on stage, I was only supposed to do three minutes. I ended up doing 17. They never gave me a light to get off. They just let me run with it because I was killing it. I was doing so good. I got off that stage and I felt like a rock star, not because Mm. people swarmed me or any of that, but because I felt like it was the most natural high I could ever achieve. And I wanted more of it. I was like, this is what I have been missing, this ability to get on stage and be completely free. And for five minutes, this is your world and you get to create it and you get to really own the stage and have a voice in a world where no one wants to hear you. Yeah, that's amazing. In a piece that you wrote for Funny Girl, an anthology of women comics and writers, you said, I come from a family of storytellers and I learned some of my best techniques from them. Can you tell us more about what it was like growing up in a family of storytellers and the kinds of stories you grew up hearing? Yeah, sure. So all of my family members, when we get around each other, we just want to tell stories. We grew up very impoverished. When I was a kid, we didn't have like satellite or cable or tons of access to movies. We had a radio station and it was one radio station and Mm -hmm. it got tiring very easily. We had the land to play on. We had lots of open space. But when we got around our cousins and our family members, all we wanted to do was tell stories because that was our form of entertainment. And traditionally, my tribes, that is something that they would do for generations back, especially in the winter time. The winter time is reserved for storytelling. There's certain stories that we can only tell in the winter. They're like deemed culturally inappropriate to tell outside of the winter. Mm -hmm. So I think this just comes from a long history of us, you know, hibernating in our teepees during the winter and needing entertainment. We had a little real estate problem includes this quote from the book, Custer Died for Your Sins by Vine Deloria. Deloria says, humor, all Indians will agree, is the cement by which the coming Indian movement is held together. Do you agree with that? Yes, 100%. And I love Vine Deloria. Vine Deloria Jr., I believe. Our creation stories have humor in them and they have tragedy in them as well. And just speaking for my own family, we're the type of family that will receive bad news and then tease each other about it. Of course, not in a moment of panic or a moment of emergency, but once the dust has settled and everyone's okay (laughs) physically, maybe that's how we process trauma. It's just like, let's just laugh about it because, you know, we don't want to get stuck here. Mm. Yeah. Would you say that formative Native American comedians like Charlie Hill have had an influence on your comedy? And if so, how? Definitely. Charlie Hill showed me that Native people do have a home on late night. Native writers do have a home working in the industry and didn't have to cater to a white audience. I love that Charlie Hill felt like Charlie Hill. You could make a lot of money as a Native person by being what non-Natives want you to be. I have a friend, (laughs) a comedian who I love, who once told me, if I go to Europe and put on my traditional clothing, I could be the highest paid prostitute in that country (laughs) or in that region. (laughs) But it's so true. You know, like there is a lot of probability in us playing the Hollywood version of what we are, but it kills our souls. These are soul killer roles. Comedians, I think, naturally are trying to heal souls, at least their own. Yeah. Rest in power, Charlie Hill, because he definitely 
gave kids like me something to feel seen and heard by. This feels like the right moment to ask you about a new TV series that's out on Peacock called Rutherford Falls. And you played a character called Shannon on this new show. For listeners who aren't familiar with the show, can you describe the premise and then explain why the show is so significant? Sure. It was groundbreaking, just really, because at the time it had the largest writing room of Native writers. And it was the first time that I saw a Native lead. So it's about a friendship between the descendant of this colonial town. He's really proud of his roots, right? And this Native woman who's really proud of her roots right now and how they navigate this history that would seemingly clash naturally, but their friendship is so real and it's so beautiful to see. And it's just nice to have representation on screen through Jana, the actress. She's just like everything really Native country has been waiting for because, you know, we're everywhere. We're literally everywhere and no one would know it because we don't put on the costume. Mm -hmm. The little girl in me, you know, in middle school definitely could have used a Jana to look up to and be like, hey, hey, you know what? I can be all of this smart and funny and beautiful and native without having to give up any of them. Nice. Yeah. Do you think things like the success of Rutherford Falls and the increasing visibility of Native American comedians like you and others are evidence of lasting change? Oh, good question. Lasting change. That's hard. I've thought about this a lot because I'm a history buff. I have a degree in American Indian studies and have studied the general story of Native people in this country since the get go. And I've seen lots of progress and I've seen lots of uh positivity and changes and there's things that have happened where it does change the entire landscape of America with Native people and non-Natives. However, I've also seen a fierce backlash and sort of a rolling back and those who are trying desperately to hold on to their perceived power are clenching even harder and they're playing even dirtier. For example, all the resistance towards critical race theory in school, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just history told by those affected by it. The problem here with all of our issues is education and who tells the stories and the textbooks are all written by straight white men rich, powerful. They all tell the stories, of course, where they paint themselves the heroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see the change happening, but I really don't think it's going to last if we don't change the education system, because that is where people are really suffering. That is why Native youth are suicidal. That is where we're going to make the most change. And really, we have to get into these textbooks and have them tell a better story. I know that we had a little real estate problem isn't a textbook, and the kind of change that's needed has to be widespread with curricula that address far more than comedy. But I learned from this book, and I think Native American comedy offers one helpful starting point for some vital conversations. Yeah, I learned a lot, too. I don't know about you, Julie. Native American history was virtually never discussed in my public schools when I was growing up, except for, you know, the old chestnut about that first joyful Thanksgiving dinner with the pilgrims and the Native Americans. And that was it for me. I don't know about you. Oh, nothing. There was nothing. Right. It's criminal that school curricula have changed so little. It is, and hopefully that will change. But back to our interview. 
Uh, it is, of course, notable that a white man wrote this book. Cliff has thought a lot about that. We asked him how the book came to be and how he went from writing a general history of American comedy to writing the unheralded story of Native Americans in comedy. Here's what he said. I got offers to do other things after the comedians. I turned most of them down just because they didn't seem to be relevant to what I do. The money jobs were like ghostwriting jobs. My agent would be like, hey, do you want to ghostwrite Dan Harmon's memoir? And I'd be like, no. Do you know who I am? Like, why would I do that? And then, you know, there were other offers like that. Why don't you do a biography of uh, Richard Pryor? I go, because there's already been like 12 of them. You know, like I want to do stuff that people don't already know about. I want to do original things. And I want to do my own vision. So I turned down so many things that I ended up using the food bank <laughs> after a couple of years, which, you know, my agent, I'm sure he's like, why don't you just take the job that's offering you $500,000, you idiot. But I knew I wouldn't be happy doing some of those jobs. So anyways, after a few years, one publisher came in with an offer and said, hey, why don't you write a book about the modern comedy boom about podcasts and Netflix? And again, I was like, do you understand that I'm a historian, right? But my agent was like, well, we got nothing else for you. I think you should write a proposal for it and submit it. So that's what I did. I wrote up this mock book proposal about the Netflix and the podcast and the comedy boom in the recent years. And one of the chapters I put in there to keep myself engaged was about the rise of the new young indigenous comedians, First Nations comics, Native American comics, the sort of emergence of this new scene. Because today there's over a hundred, at least, uh, indigenous stand-up, sketch, and improv performers. And a lot of uh, white people are unaware of that. So I put that just as a 10-page chapter in this book proposal. The publisher said, great, let's do it. They didn't even mention that Native American chapter. My agent, as he usually does, shopped that uh, proposal around to other publishers to try and boost the price that would be offered, you know, get a bidding war going. And Simon and Schuster saw the proposal and they said, we read your proposal about this modern comedy boom with podcasts and Netflix. We think it sucks. We think it's stupid. We think it's <laughs> bullshit. We think it's rotten. I said, I agree. But they said, the one chapter you have in there about the rise of new young indigenous comics that's really interesting to us. We didn't know about that. I don't see anybody else writing about that. If you would like to do an entire book just about that, we will give you a book deal. So I said, yeah, that would be good. Not without a bit of trepidation because I am a white guy and we're at a moment in history, which should have been the moment all along, where native peoples should be in charge of their own stories because traditionally it's white people that are in charge of these often inaccurate native American uh, presentations, you know, whether it's films, TV books. So I did not want to be contributing to that problem, but I accepted the book deal regardless because I felt like maybe I could use my platform for something good. You know, it was the start of the Trump era. Children were being literally kidnapped at the border by the federal government. You'd hear a lot of liberal people go, this isn't who we are. You know, this is like unprecedented. This isn't America. But if you truly study American history and Canadian history and Australian history and New Zealand history and any colonial, you'll see that is exactly the history. And if you're indigenous, you know that because... Throughout the 1800s, it was federal policy in Canada and the United States to kidnap children from their native parents, ship them 300 miles away, and force them to attend military regimented schools that would drum the indigenous language out of their mind and totally erase their belief system and separate them from the influence of their parents so that they could be remade as model, quote unquote, American people, white, Christian, church going. But in order to do so, they separated them from their parents, created incredible amounts of trauma 
that would never be erased for the rest of their lives and murdered many of those children along the way. In Canada, there was a magazine article in 1908 that said that one third of all the indigenous children that were sent to those schools died before they graduated. And most of those schools, instead of having a playground, like most schools, where there would have been a playground, there was a cemetery. Mm -hmm. So as you were writing about this experience as a non-native, how did you go about trying to make sure that you didn't seize control of the stories? Well, I just took a step back as much as possible. The only, even though it's not called an oral history, so much of the book is basically oral history where I just let, you know, a contemporary comedian tell their story and then that's it. You know, there's no additional editorial from me. There are whole chapters where the only word that I have typed that is from my own head is says so-and-so. Mm -hmm. I don't add anything else. It was still very delicate. It's still delicate. Even promoting it is delicate. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the formative Native American comedians. Can you talk about Charlie Hill? Sure. Yeah. Charlie Hill was the first Native American comedian to appear on network television. He did the Richard Pryor show in 1977. That was his TV debut. And then he did The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson in 1978. And the name of this book, we had a little real estate problem, is the punchline to one of his most famous jokes. I'll paraphrase it for you, and I'm not doing it justice, but people can go on YouTube and watch Charlie Hill's stand-up set on The Richard Pryor Show, and he opens with this joke. Uh, My name is Charlie Hill. I'm Oneida. My people are from Wisconsin. We used to be from New York, but uh, we had a little real estate problem. So that was his opening joke, you know, this great diffuser. And it always got a big laugh because people understood what that meant. 1974, he moved to Los Angeles. A few months later, a guy named David Letterman moved from Indianapolis to Los Angeles. And this becomes Charlie Hill's social circle. He is performing at the Comedy Store on a regular basis. The only Native American stand-up comedian on the bill for most people, the first Native American stand-up comedian they'd ever seen. Much of his act was about that. He would go on stage and go, yeah, I'm Native American. I bet a lot of you white people didn't even know that uh, Native Americans could be comedians. Yeah, well, you know what? We never thought you were too funny either. You know, and that would always get a big laugh. And Richard Pryor was in the comedy store one night. Charlie Hill was on stage. And Richard Pryor just fell in love with him because Richard Pryor's act was often about roasting white people and talking about racism. Here's Charlie Hill on stage doing the exact same thing, but from a Native American perspective. So when Charlie Hill got off stage the first night, Richard Pryor said, we got to get together, motherfucker. You talk to these white people like they're dogs. (laughs) He was so excited. And he took him out into the parking lot. They smoked a joint together. And Richard Pryor goes, Charlie, have you uh, ever been on TV? And Charlie goes, no, man, I'm brand new. I've never been on TV. And Richard Pryor took a drag from the joint. He nodded, passed the joint over and said, don't worry, I'll get you on. And he did. A few months later, Richard Pryor had his own NBC variety show. It was a sketch comedy show. And the only person to do stand-up on that show was Charlie Hill. And that night, the Richard Pryor show reached... 15 million viewers. So 15 million people saw this Native American stand-up comedian slay the audience. And Charlie Hill very quickly became a hero in Native communities all over North America. He did not necessarily become a household name in white households, but in indigenous communities, it was like, whoa, this is something fresh, something new. And this is somebody who has broken this glass ceiling. This is a guy who is representing us from an informed perspective. He's not doing stereotypes. He's not Iron Eyes Cody. He's not a white guy pretending to be Native American. And he's not somebody who is ashamed or shirking. And up to that point, it had mostly been stereotypes and dehumanized depictions of indigenous people on TV and in movies. So Charlie Hill was more important, I think, 
than anybody has ever really properly acknowledged. I really don't want this episode to end. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Both Adrian and Cliff are great storytellers and they're talking about important matters that are too often overlooked. And they're funny. (laughs) Yeah, they're really funny. (laughs) We're going to put a list in the show notes of Native American comedy acts that Adrian and Cliff recommended with links. So everyone listening can take a look. Yes. And we'll bring this episode to a close now so you can go right away and do that. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. You can find Adrian at www.chalapa.com or on Instagram at Adrian Chalapa and Cliff on Twitter at Classic Showbiz. Many thanks to our producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eviohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julian.